This week on the podcast, YouTube, and website, we have something that's really been a long time coming, and that is a deep dive into the Vexus. Now, what I love about this is that, firstly, I get to talk to people that are passionate about it. That's uh, August Longino and Matt Racinti out at Denver Health. And secondly, that it is a really kind of futuristic view while showing you the basics of it as well. So it's clinical application, it's new research that's coming out, it's discussing the research that's already out there. I think this is going to be a very good learning opportunity for uh, so many people because as I learned while going through this and speaking with these amazing people, there are so many applications for this apart from the uh, patient that has on dialysis, the liver patient, the heart failure patient. There's so many other things that this potentially could be useful for. Check it out. Hello, and welcome to the Ultrasound Podcast. My name is Jalen Avila, and I have with me a very special co-host, Matt Racinti. Now, Matt, you and I have known each other for quite a few years, and I get to see you in, really, it's like a month, uh, maybe a month and a half at uh, Sound and Surf here in San Diego, 2024, November 6th through 8th, and it is sold out. Um, which I kind of feel bad about, but I'm also excited about. If you have, you know, if you're listening and watching and you want more info or you want to see the virtual version of it, which should come out about a week after the conference, um, just head over to soundandsurf.com and we'll sign you up. Hey, Matt, good to see you. Jalen, great to see you as always. Thanks for having us on. Of course. For those uh, who have not met me or seen me, uh, my name is Matt Racinti. I'm the ultrasound director at the Denver Health Emergency Medicine Department and the Fellowship Director. I'm also the co-founder of the Focus Atlas. And today I'm here with Dr. Angus Longino, who I've been working with for several years as um, kind of like a research collaborator for Vexus work. August is currently a hospitalist in the Denver metro area. He's a research associate at Denver Health and he is a recent graduate of the University of Colorado Internal Medicine Residency. Um, we've had this awesome co- collaboration between him, emergency medicine, and cardiology for a few years, and he's here to get us up to speed on the Vexus and some of the research that we've been working on. August. Hey, everybody. Really nice to meet you. So this is a, a passion project for me and an area of interest to, I think, a lot of us who are into bedside ultrasound is this concept of Doppler ultrasound for volume assessment. So that's what I'm here to talk about today. Is how I can sort of demystify this concept of venous excess ultrasound, also called the Vexus. So today, I want to walk you through a couple things. This is what I want to cover. So I want to talk about what is venous excess ultrasound, what is Vexus, and how can you do it in practice? What evidence suggests that you should use this, and who is it for? And then finally, I want to cover what questions still need answering about this technique, and what is going to happen with Doppler ultrasound moving forward, and who's doing that work. All right, so there's an ironclad law that all talks like this one have to have a case, and so here's ours. So you're gonna see a 67-year-old gentleman with shortness of breath. You're walking around the emergency room. You get called into room two. You see a 67-year-old rancher. He's got a history of colon cancer, some new shortness of breath, and some swelling in his legs. That's what he's coming in for. He tells you- The mariner got old. Yeah, that's Kevin Costner. He's uh, from Waterworld. You know, he's a, yeah, originally Waterworld, now Yellowstone, but he's at the top of his game, and he's in your Ready. emergency room today. Okay, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. the Mariners in my ER, and uh, the water's receded, and he's now rancher. Uh, got it. Yeah, but he has some other problems with water. Uh, there's his kids say that he doesn't take his meds, and he cannot adhere to his low sodium diet, especially when he's all stressed out. So you go and take a look at him. He's pretty tachycardic. He's breathing pretty fast. He's desatting. As you're talking to him, they're wheeling the BiPAP into the room, and his blood pressure is 100 over 60. So you're a little worried about him. You go to do an exam. He's got crackles at his bilateral bases, don't we all? Uh, and you try to do a volume exam, and he's just got one of those necks. It's sort of hard to, hard to figure out what's going on with his JVP. But you look at his legs. You see that they're warm, uh, and they're kind of puffy. So you go look at the, you go back to the computer, you see some red numbers. So he's got a little bit of an AKI, he's got some hyperkalemia, his CBC looks okay. 
BNP is up, his trope is normal, his lactate is 2.4. You check an EKG, which just shows some LVH. Here's his chest x-ray. Give me a moment to scrutinize that. What does BL101 mean, sorry? Uh, so sorry, uh, baseline 1.1. Got it. All right. Got it. Got it. He's got it. So he doesn't have CKD. He's normally 1.1. He's at 3.1. Got it. Got it. So you get a chest x-ray. Radiologist says, correlate clinically. What do you think is going on? And so like any good physician, you go ahead and order some Lasix for this guy who seems volume overloaded. But all of a sudden, a pop-up flashes on your screen and says, the lactate is 2.4. This man has sepsis. Give him a 30 cc per kilogram bolus. And you think to yourself, what is this guy's volume status? And how do you know? Well, the problem with that question is that volume status is a pretty tricky question. And basically, if you work in any realm of medicine, whether that's the emergency room, the clinic, the hospital, you are probably asking yourself questions about, quote, volume status multiple times a day. But what is volume status? It turns out that it's a pretty nebulous concept. And if you put two doctors of any kind into a room with a patient and you ask them, what's the volume status, you're probably going to end up getting three or more different responses because people use different metrics for volume status. Some people talk about JVP, some people talk about urine output, some people talk about leg swelling. But what we know for sure is that these metrics of volume status are very, have very poor levels of inter-rater reliability. We're not good at this exam. And Part of that is because volume status is this nebulous concept. I would argue that really what we're asking when we ask what is the volume status, we're asking two better questions. Now, the first of these questions is, would extra fluid help my patient in this situation? We're all very familiar with this concept. This is the paradigm that we exist under for sepsis resuscitation, for example, fluid responsiveness. And this is what we're talking about when we're looking at VTI when we're doing passive leg raises, when we're answering this question of, should I give a liter of LR? I think a slightly more subtle question that we, are also, that we are also asking ourselves, even if we don't know it, is, is fluid hurting my patient right now? Do they need diuresis or should I hesitate before I plug in that liter of LR? Um, so August, I have, a, I have a question for you. Um, as a hospitalist and a doc who covers the ICU, how would you manage this patient now? Let's pretend you didn't have an ultrasound, right? So you have BNP elevation, you have um, chest X-ray uh, showing probably pulmonary edema, and then an AKI. I mean, this is what we just hit admit for in the ER, and I'd love to know what you would be doing about this. Like, today. wait, Matt, I don't do you, I don't do that, Matt. <laughs> I mean, Matt, I'll, I don't do that. One might do Matt, that. Stop yelling at me. I never just hit admit when I have forty-five patients to see. <laughs> and I don't know what to do. And I reach my cognitive load. Yeah, this is this is what we uh, we appreciate about you, August. Yeah. Well, naturally, they, you call the internal medicine doctor who uh, will engage you in a 30 minute conversation about this very question. Um, and so hopefully today we talk about some tools that can allow you to reduce your cognitive load and get your patient admitted for the right indication uh, without them asking you to do a bunch of extra stuff downstairs. Yeah, the, the answer to those questions for me is always, um, you can order that. Yeah. Um, the other thing, Matt, what do you, I mean, what do you do? I mean, we, we both use ultrasound and I think towards the end, it would be good to kind of like discuss, I guess, um, like a bronze medal, um, participation trophy for volume responsiveness and volume tolerance. Cause I have my own kind of like thoughts on what I do when, um, I don't have the bandwidth capacity or honestly, I don't have the right patient to do all, um, all this Doppler assessment because maybe I just can't see the hepatic veins very clearly. Or I don't get a good waveform. Big thing for me, which I'll have a question for you August later, um, is what do you do when the patient is tachypnic? Um, I found that that is, it's like impossible for me to do vexus when the patient is tachypnic because there's so much movement. Um, but Matt, what do you do um, as a fellow ER doctor if you have a patient like this and let's say, you know, you have you know, 45 patients in the waiting room, you have 45 patients you're actively managing, you have 10 psych patients and four nurses called out. Like, how do you handle this patient then? Yeah. I, I mean, I think me as a, a POCUS practitioner and advocate, I'm at least going to be looking at heart, lungs, IVC, right. To kind of give me my first best guess. Um, and, and I do have questions, uh, you know, just 
today for August and you about why Vexus adds things over that. And I think we're starting to get answers. Um, but yeah, that, that would be my answer. I would look heart lungs IVC, but I'm not even sure that most ER docs in, in the country are doing even that. So um, that was kind of the nature of my initial question for August. Yeah, I think this example is, you know, the, the pretest probability for this gentleman being uh, fluid responsive versus fluid tolerant uh, is, you know, leans pretty heavily in the direction of fluid, uh, uh, you know, of uh, being fluid intolerant. He seems congested. However, uh, you can imagine that if, you know, maybe that lower extremity edema is, like, you know, maybe one of the sides is really red and really tender. Uh, maybe there's a more convincing source of, of potential infection. And of course, I think a really important place where this conversation gets more complex is when people have known cardiac pathology. Patients are allowed to have more than one problem. So when you you come in, this guy says, my, my, hey doc, I happen to know that my ejection fraction is 20% and I have severe tricuspid regurgitation. Oh, and by the way, uh, I got a spider bite uh, a week ago and my, and my <laughs> it's leg really hurts. always a spider. Hurts. It's always a spider. Yeah, the uh, MRSA spider. And then you're in a pickle because the computer is going to say what it always says when the lactate is 2.4, which is give this person 30 cc's per kilogram. And you as a, as a thinking physician are in a, in a classic bind of how much fluid and is it really going to help? And so that, and so those are, yeah, the, so, you know, this initial case aside, I think that when we see these patients in the hospital, that's where I see the, that's where I see the utility of, uh, of, technique, of techniques like the one we're going to talk about today. I'm going to take a brief pause here just to let you know that all of our content is on the coreultrasound.com website. That is Ultrasound Podcast, 5 Minutes Sono, Ultrasound of the Week, Clip Bank, and we also have our courses page where we have the Core Ultrasound Fundamentals and Core Ultrasound Question Bank where you have 3,200 questions with feedback, including narrated videos explaining the question. Check it out and back to your video. So I want to focus on this concept of, is fluid hurting my patient? What we call fluid intolerance or fluid tolerance. And in order to think about that, I want to frame the discussion by talking about this different parameter called organ perfusion pressure. So way back there in medical school, we all learned about this. And this is just the concept that in order for, in order for oxygen to arrive to an organ uh, and then for CO2 to get carried away from it, to get perfusion, there's actually two sides to that gradient. One is the arterial side and one is the venous side. So we're all very familiar with the mean arterial pressure. And what I don't want people to forget is that in order to perfuse organs, you also need to think about what's called the mean systemic filling pressure or the venous pressure. And as you can see, there's basically two ways you can achieve hypoperfusion. We're all used to thinking about patients with a low MAP. We walk into a room with a sick patient. First number we look at is generally the MAP or the systolic blood pressure. This person's in shock. They have hypoperfusion. But a sort of sneaky occult form of hypoperfusion can also happen when you have a high mean systemic filling pressure or a high venous pressure. I think a really illustrative example of this for me was cardiorenal syndrome. So... Way back in medical school, I was taught about cardiorenal syndrome by a cardiologist who told me, Dr. Longino, cardiorenal syndrome happens because the heart is weak and it can't feed the kidneys and the kidneys get upset and that's how cardiorenal syndrome works. In the not too recent past, a group of nephrologists actually went out to try to explore that mechanism a little bit better. They asked the question, what is the relationship between creatinine, ejection fraction, cardiac output, and CVP? Basically asking the question, is serum creatinine, or AKI, correlated with forward flow from the heart or back up behind the heart? And so they asked this that's question. A, that's really a, a really interesting way to like frame that, honestly, because um, it, it's saying the same thing that we always think about, but I've, I guess I've never thought about it that way. And I'm wondering, like I hear that, but is it, what's what's the advantage to thinking about it that way versus is it just a different perspective on the same thing? Well, I think you can, the, the question is, you know, so if, if, if it's a left heart problem, right? So if, if that cardiologist was right, uh, and, you know, and the problem is that your, your left heart is weak 
and you're and you don't have forward flow, uh, then maybe you could use you know inotropes or um, afterload reduction to try to augment flow to the kidneys. Yeah, this is the the paradigm is that the kidneys are thirsty; they need more perfusion, they, they need more forward flow to the kidneys. Mm -hmm. uh, the another perspective, you know, sort of the congestive perspective, is that you know it's not actually a problem of forward flow. You might have plenty of forward flow, but if the you know, if you have pressure getting to the kidneys, if the pressure gradient across the kidneys, if you don't have that difference, then you know you're you're still going to get hypoperfusion. Then maybe you want to think about diuresis. Maybe you want to think about a way to decongest the patient instead of just augmenting their forward flow. That makes sense. I that conceptualizes it very clearly for me. Thank you. And so and and so I think you know, this this con this conceptualization, this framework that I learned in medical school. It has real implications for how I would go about treating patients, right? And so these nephrologists, they got 178 patients, all of whom were undergoing right heart catheterization and getting BMPs, and they decided to answer this question. Is it forward flow or is it congestion? And this is what they found. Um, so this is Nanaraj and Googlin. It's a, a, a really nice set of articles. So this is, a nice, this is one of their central illustrations from their, from their paper. And on the y-axis, we have GFR. So you want your GFR to be high, not low. Uh, and then on the x-axis, they basically divided the ejection fractions of their patients into low, medium, and high. So these are tertiles of ejection fraction versus GFR. No significant relationship. Whether your EF is high, whether it's low, your GFR is the same. However, when they looked at central venous pressure, so same y-axis, GFR, but on the x-axis, now we're looking at groups of, of central venous pressure or retrograde pressure, intracardiac filling pressures. They saw that having a high CVP was correlated with a low GFR. And so that led them to write this great little uh, article in clinical cardiology, renal dysfunction and heart failure is due to congestion, but not low output. And so what they found when they did the math was that cardiorenal AKI was associated with these increased cardiac filling pressures, not low cardiac output, and they specifically looked at cardiac output and cardiac index and saw no relationship. But they did see a relationship between serum creatinine and velocity of tricuspid regurgitation, but not with the EF. And that is because that cardiologist who taught me way back in medical school was incorrect. Cardiorenal AKI is not due to hypotension. It's not due to a low cardiac output. It's due to a deranged organ perfusion pressure. We just can't get blood across the kidney in order to get oxygen to it and carry CO2 away from it. Now, that's, a, you know, that's one paper in 2011, but I'd like to point out that we've actually known this for a long time. So this is a, a citation from 1931. Uh, about a hundred years ago when Fred Winton was uh, out there in London doing absolutely terrible things to dogs. I also like that you said it a hundred years ago, like that it sounded sarcastic, um, but it was literally almost a hundred years ago. It's crazy. Yeah. We, this is old knowledge, right? We like every couple, every, you know, generation or two, we rediscover this concept. Uh, but Fred was back there, you know, in, in very early medicine, uh, doing really ghastly things to mammalian kidneys. And what he found was that it was the venous pressure of the kidney rather than the arterial pressure that had the greatest impact on urine output. So he was basically studying AKI in isolation. So I hope that I've convinced you that congestion is real. Congestion is something that we should care about. And if we care, we should be able to measure it. So how do we measure congestion? Well, you have some options. You can do a right heart catheterization. You can do a physical exam, which we've talked about, or uh, as Matt brought up, you can do know. ultrasound. I, I don't know. Physical, physical. What do you think, Matt? Physical exam? <laughs> I, I just I don't, don't know. Roll for it. No. I just don't see a roll. Yeah, yeah exactly. Not, not when there are sound waves. <laughs> That's right. Um, and, Matt, and Matt pointed out, you know, he, when he's going to assess a patient, uh, yeah, he's going to look at the heart, the lungs, he's going to look at the, uh, the IBC if he's feeling fancy. He might look at a, a, a JVP on, you know, with, it, with an ultrasound and look for that wine glass sign. Just to kind of go back a little bit, right? Go back to that, the, the slide with the 2011 study, right? I mean, um, like to, to just kind of conclude, like this is so antithetical of like what we're saying, right? When we're looking at heart, lungs, IVC, right? Like if we really are looking at just the ejection fraction and, and cardiac output, like 
truly that's not helping us with this patient at all. I mean, we already know that half of the heart failures, diastolic heart failure. Is that statistic still true? I just say that blindly. I say it blindly too. I know where I heard it. Like I remember Amal Matu saying it. Yeah. Um, and I haven't, I just trust anything that he says without verification. So yeah. please, if anybody's listening and, and can refute or deny that until it's told otherwise, I'm going to assume a mom or two is correct in everything. August, um, give us the, give us a, yeah, yeah is, is that, that right? right? Absolutely. A hundred percent correct. Half okay. of all, okay, heart, half of all heart <laughs> failure is diastolic heart failure. Um, a mom or two is vindicated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is just so different than like what we're teaching when we're talking about um, fluid tolerance, responsiveness, so on and so forth. I mean, it still may or may not account for IVC, which we're going to talk about more, but um, yeah, this is, this is really outstanding. So I wonder, Matt, if this uh, and August, I guess, because when you said that, like what you do is you do heart, lungs, and IVC, like that's something that I, I do as well. I will say that I, I tend to start with the IVC because um, I try to get to the answer the, the earliest. But I almost invariably, I'm going to look at the heart and I'm going to look at the lungs too. So it gives me a full picture. But I'm wondering, does this mean that in a patient in whom you're trying to figure out if they are, you know, the broad patient, right? Because you could also have a patient that has heart failure um, as their diagnosis. And you're trying like, that is the problem today. You know that. Um, and you're trying to figure out, you know, inotropes versus whatever versus diuresis. Um, maybe in that situation it's helpful, but in, in like, let's say like a undifferentiated patient that's gotten their like third, fourth, fifth, sixth liter to know, like maybe, you know, starting with the IVC and this is probably segue into the vexus, right? Maybe starting with the IVC is the most necessary. And then the, uh, the lungs and the heart are there in case there's a gray area, maybe. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then it's different if it's the undifferentiated dysmic patient, right? Where I'm going to probably do lungs, heart, IVC, right? If we yeah. actually don't know what's wrong with them. Right. Um, but then once the IVC is dilated or whatever, not collapsible, which mm -hmm. however I describe it, um, the right treatment will come from Vexus maybe. So yeah. anyway. Yeah. Thank you. I, you guys are setting me up really nicely. I really appreciate it. So I hope I've convinced you at this point that congestion is real, that we should care about it. And I would say if we care about something, we should be able to measure that thing in our patients. So how do we measure congestion? We have some options. You can do what we do when we really don't know, so we get a right heart catheterization. You can also do a physical exam, or you can use an ultrasound. You can look at the, the IBC, you can look at the IJ. People have a lot of different tricks that they can use. But for the moment, let's focus on our gold standard. So. When you're in the hospital and you really want to know if your patient is wet or dry, this is what you do. I think that most of us would agree that a right atrial pressure, invasively measured by, an, uh, by a cardiologist, or a right atrial pressure over 10 is consistent with congestion. That person needs to get some diuresis. Now, there are pros to this technique. So this is the definitive measurement. It's got a very high rate of interrater reliability. You're measuring the thing you care about at the source. However, there are also some cons. It's resource intensive. To get this done for your patients, you need a cath lab, you need a cardiologist, you need a cardiologist who will take your calls. It's invasive. So the, you know, you're accessing a patient's central vasculature and there are risks associated with this. You know, the, even at experienced centers, the complication rate for right heart catheterization is around 1%. And it's time consuming. So a right heart cath is not something that you can do and then do something to your patient and then repeat it to see if it worked. It's kind of an unwieldy test in that way. This is sort of a cartoonish representation of a right heart catheterization where basically we are gonna put a pressure transducer through the chambers of the heart. And all that line is showing us is, the, is the, what that pressure transducer is seeing in different, in different heart chambers. And so, yeah, if the pressure is high in the right atrium, that corresponds with volume overload and pressures in the heart being high. Um, and you know, then we thread it through the right ventricle up into the pulmonary artery. That can give us information about whether or not the patient has pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and then we kind of thread it all the way through into the capillaries of the lung. And we wedge it there. Uh, and that sort of forms, that gives us a, a sense of what the left atrial pressure is. So this is an invasive technique that tells us what is the pressure at every section of the, of the heart. 
uh, and gives you a really comprehensive sense of a patient's hemodynamics. It tells you about their forward flow, it tells you about their retrograde pressure, and it tells you about the resistance in the lungs that goes between the two sides of the heart. So when I really want to know what's happening with my patient's hemodynamics and their heart, this is what I ask a cardiologist to do. The problem is that you got to get a cardiologist on the phone, they have to do your procedure, they have to call you back, and so it can take quite a long time between me asking the question and getting the answer. And so this one is, a, is an example of what it could look like in each chamber? Yes. Exactly. So, uh, as you, you know, as you see where that where that black dot is, so yeah, you uh, you see when the black dot is in the right atrium, the pressures are below ten. You thread it into the right ventricle, and then you see that there's a systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure, and it moves on into the PA. Again, you see a higher pressure during systole, a lower pressure during diastole. We usually take the average of those, and we and we the piece of feedback that we get, you know, we hear about a mean PA pressure. Um, and then as you thread it out into the pulmonary vessels, uh, you get much lower amplitudes um, and you see the, the pressures in, uh, in the left atrium. That, uh, that swans is giving, it's giving snake IO. <laughs> yes. You know, like as it snakes in, it just like the back stays and it just keeps getting bigger. Totally. Yeah. And the snake IO catheter. Um, and of course, like we used to do these all the time. Like this is like a this is a all, not a not a relic because people we still do them a lot. But it used to yeah. be much more common in critical care that every patient would have one of these. Uh, and then as time has moved on, we've seen that it's not as uh, probably wasn't helping us as much as we thought. And so this has really fallen out of practice. Um, so it's not something that we do routinely in all of our patients anymore in the same way that we used to. And so this is even though it gives us a lot of data, it's not always available. So we need something new. We need something that is cheap, that is safe for our patients, that's repeatable once you do some stuff. We want it to be reproducible. So if I do, if I do the same thing to five patients, I want it to sort of behave the same way each time. And I want it to be accurate. I want to be able to trust the results of what I'm seeing. Now, what I've just described are the test characteristics of an ECG. And the cardiologists have already stolen this from us. So what I want is an ECG for venous congestion. Cheap, safe, repeatable, reproducible, and accurate. It's the perfect test. That's where Vexus comes in. So you remember way back at the beginning of this talk, I said, today we're going to talk about venous excess ultrasound. And this is what it is. So it's nothing fancy. You don't need a new gadget. You use the ultrasound that you have in your emergency room or your clinic, and you do a four-point protocol. So it's an IVC measurement. And then you do Doppler ultrasound of the hepatic, portal, and renal veins. And what this is billed as is a non-invasive means of determining venous congestion. This is what has now become a really landmark paper, at least for me. Uh, back in 2020... Hey, it's got Felipe on it. Yeah. Uh, I, I imagine these guys are known to you. Um, but back in 2020, this uh, group of Canadian physicians got together and said, we need a better test for venous congestion. And so they got together and did some really innovative, interesting modeling. And they did 706 exams of 145 specifically post-cardiac surgery patients. And they derived what we now call the VEXA score, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But basically they said, these are characteristic Doppler waveforms of different parts of the human body that, are, that correlate with cardiorenal acute kidney injury. And what they found was that when they made this score that ranged from 0 to 3, in this population, post-cardiac surgery patients, having a VEXIS grade of 3 had a positive likelihood ratio of 6.37 for post-operative AKI, which is awesome. That is a great positive likelihood ratio. And importantly, it was, a, they, it was better at predicting who got post-op AKI than the central venous pressure measurements that were done for these patients intra-op. And so in their results and discussion, they said, hey, we have this new technique. It's fast, it's safe, and it might be better than right heart cap. So yeah. this, this was the like Sentinel paper on the topic, right? This is what defined it. Yep. It's also a derivation paper, if I remember correctly, where they kind of came up with all these waveforms and classifications and then came up with this measurement or this cutoff, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So this is... The, as I say, the, really the landmark paper where they walk through 
not just the experiment that they did where they, um, you know, they kind of talk about how they acquired all the images, but then there's some, if you're a nerd, um, some really cool modeling and some really cool math that they did to, where they separated their data set and said, you know, for the first chunk of the data set, we're going to look at what predicts post-op AKI, and then they validated it in the second half of the data set and said, yep, it still works. Uh, and they and they basically tested a bunch of different iterations and different combinations of Doppler waveforms, and they said, which one best predicts this outcome that we care about? And it's a really nicely done paper. I was actually, I'm looking at the authors here. I have it down on that screen. Um, and Corbin is like, he works like an hour from me. Um, he's in Riverside or Loma Linda. And then Rory, um, he introduced me to one of my favorite sci-fi series by uh, Patrick Rothfuss. Um, it's called The Name of the Wind. If you happen to like sci-fi and fantasy, it's a, a really good magic system. Um, but it's kind of cool to like see like, I mean, I've obviously seen this before, but it's it's nice to see my like friends on here, my ultrasound nerd friends that I, some of them, I, I'm pretty sure I saw Corbin uh, within the past year, but I haven't seen Rory in like a year or two. I think he's uh, he's busy doing critical care and jujitsu and having in taking care of his children and stuff. So he doesn't, he doesn't come to our conferences anymore. Well, it's cool that you guys know them. I, like for me, these guys are like celebrities. Like I think like it's, it's very well, cool. Well, me too. That you that you hang out with them. I actually just gave uh, critical care grand rounds at the University of Maryland, where uh, Dr. Spiegel trained, and so they're all you know they they're, they're all true believers. Uh, you know they're still going over his data sets and stuff to try to 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 find more uses for Doppler ultrasound. Yeah, he's brilliant. Uh, but I will say that you know I owe a great debt to these guys for for kind of starting us off in this direction. So now I want to talk about how you actually do this. We've talked a little bit about what it is, what it's for. Now I want to talk about how you do it. So as I said, you start with the IVC, and then you're going to do Doppler ultrasound of the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and the renal veins. We're going to walk through these one by one. We're going to talk about how to acquire the view, where to acquire the view, and then how to interpret the data that you get. So the first view you're going to obtain is the IVC. We like to use an abdominal probe, especially if your patient's a little bit larger, has a little bit more redundant tissue. That said, you can also use a phased array or cardiac probe here, and it works just as well. You just gotta flip your orientation. Um, and so you know, you're gonna find, you're gonna go just right at the patient's midline, just like you always do to find your IVC. But something I wanna draw your attention to is there are a couple components that we really need to locate in the IVC view to make sure that it is what we would call a good view or a high quality image. And so you'll notice here there are a couple components. So first of all, you want to be able to visualize the IVC as it enters the right atrium. And that lets you know that this is really the IVC and not that very common mimic, which is the aorta. And then unique to the VEXA scan, I want you to be able to visualize the hepatic vein insertion because for two reasons. First of all, we're going to go find the hepatic vein again in just a second because it's a part of the, of the exam, but also because this is where we measure our IVC. So we measure the IVC just distal to the, uh, to the hepatic vein insertion point right there. We just go inside wall to inside wall. And all you have to remember at this point is, is the IVC bigger or smaller than two centimeters? No Doppler, no nothing, nothing fancy. You've done it a million times. IVC ultrasound. The next view you're going to get is the hepatic view. And so while you can stay in that same kind of sub xiphoid view, I will often move over to the patient's right to use the liver as a window. And so you can see me here, you can be parallel like this, or you can angle your probe so that you can get between the ribs. But the structure that you're looking for is the hepatic vein, which you can see there on the right between those rib shadows. And it's going to be a branching, thin-walled structure. And that distinction is going to become important in just a second. So you're going to look for you know, a, a thin-walled, black, branching vessel. So this is the first time that we are going to talk about how to acquire your Doppler waveform. And so if you've done Doppler in the past, you know that you start with that 2D image. And then you need to place your Doppler gate. So you're going to drag your Doppler gate across. And really, you can put it anywhere along the hepatic vein. It has not been well studied as to like where is the ideal position for the Doppler gate. I would say try to avoid the conjunction of the hepatic vein with the IVC because you can get a lot of turbulence and noise there. Um, but really, you just want to go anywhere along the length of that vessel. 
So now for those of you who haven't done a lot of Doppler ultrasound, the next step once you find that vessel is going to be acquiring your Doppler waveform. And so the way this works is that you have a, a normal 2D image in front of you. Then you're going to hit Doppler and you're going to get a Doppler gate, which you're going to move onto your screen and you can put it anywhere along the hepatic vein. I would say it's try to stay away from the confluence of the hepatic vein with the IVC where you can have a lot of noise and turbulence that can kind of confound your image, but otherwise you're really kind of free to go on any hepatic vein that you see. And then you're going to generate some waves. So these are, this is the, I think for many people, the intimidating part of the VESTIS exam, and I'm going to show you that it's really not that hard. One thing I do want to highlight though, is that you'll see on all of our waveforms, there's an accompanying ECG. And so that sort of allows us to locate ourselves in the cardiac cycle as opposed to the respiratory cycle. So Jalen, earlier you were saying like, I don't know how to do this when people are breathing really fast. I have this tachypnic patient, the waves are going all over the place, especially if they're tachycardic and tachypnic, like who knows what wave I'm looking at. And that I think is why the ECG is so important um, because it, it'll, yeah, it sort of tells you exactly where you are in the cardiac cycle. And so for the hepatic waveform, you, you see basically two downward deflections, uh, which is blood flowing from the hepatic vein towards the heart. And so during... So, sorry. Um, so this is a, this is a setting where the, you put in ECG leads directly into your ultrasound machine? Yeah, we find okay. that it, it helps interpretation a lot and we can show you some data on, and I will show some data about that at the back end of the presentation. Okay. Um, but just like the um, but just like the cardiologists do for ECG gated studies, this is it really helps with interpretation. I don't think okay. that it's essential. Like if your if your ultrasound doesn't do this, I think it's still a useful technique. Um, but it reduces the amount of squinting and head scratching that you do, uh, you know, when you're first interpreting the study. Yeah, because like uh, squinting, I don't like doing per se because then that means that I have to push up like my Botox a few months if I use those muscles a lot. So if not just for that, I think that it would be helpful. Yes. Our goal apart is- Apart from patient care. I, our goal is skin quality Botox. for all providers. Right, less Botox for, for cause we gotta think about us as well about ergonomics and the amount of money we spend on Botox. Absolutely. Everybody knows this. All right, so this is a normal waveform. Uh, in our patients who are who are not congested, so they have normal normal flow, they're what is called the S wave. So this is the first wave you see after the QRS, which corresponds with systole. So the systolic wave is going to be larger than the diastolic wave. So you see big forward flow of blood during systole, and then a, a still forward flow, but slightly less during diastole. Then patients who are mildly abnormal, they're getting a little bit backed up. You'll see that S wave shrink. And so the ratio of the S wave to the D wave inverts. And so here you see QRS, here's that S wave, and you'll notice that now it's smaller than the D wave. So there's your mildly I'm seeing, congested patient. I'm seeing here why the ECG matters, because like if I just saw that waveform in isolation, I wouldn't know which is the e S and which is the D. And for this, it matters to go from like a normal to a mildly abnormal. So yeah. I'm seeing it now. So if you, especially if the patient's tachycardic, Mm -hmm. So now all that's happened is that that S wave has gotten smaller relative to the D wave. And physiologically, what that's corresponding to is during systole, your ventricles contract and the, your tricuspid valve is pulled down a little bit during that contraction. Uh, and, so, and so blood flows forward into the right atrium. And so blood flows away from the liver into the heart. And then as you get congested, that RV is, is filled, it has more filling. Um, and so the pressure in that RV is higher, making the pressure in the RA higher. And so when you have that systolic contraction, less blood is able to, to flow forward, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that relationship becomes even clearer when you look at severely abnormal or highly congested patients. So in patients who are severely congested, their S wave actually goes backwards. So their S wave flips over and you see, you'll see the QRS followed by an S that's going upwards, which means that blood is flowing back towards your probe, blood is flowing out of the out of the heart during systole back towards the liver. This is basically just tricuspid regurgitation, right? 
And then the only time that you see forward flow is during diastole, when all those valves open and the heart fills. And then during systole, blood is going to get shot back towards your probe. So that's normal, mildly abnormal, and severely abnormal for the hepatic vein. One thing I want you to remember is that for all of these waveforms that we're going to discuss, uh, it's kind of interesting and fun to know the mildly abnormal and normal setting uh, views, but in order to grade the vexus, you really only need to know the severely abnormal waveform. So bear that in mind. The next view you're going to obtain is the portal view. And so now we're going to be looking at the portal vein. You don't need to move your transducer very much here. Uh, you can basically just rock or uh, uh, you can just rock or fan a little bit uh, to see a different vessel. On the right, you, what you might be able to see is that now we're looking for this very thick-walled vessel, that's the portal vein, as opposed to that thin-walled branching structure we saw earlier. So here we can see it in a little bit more depth. And really, we're just looking for that thick white wall that surrounds what is usually a thicker vessel, or can be a thicker vessel, depending on the degree of congestion of the patient. Uh, and that is going to be your portal vein. And once again, you can really put your Doppler gate anywhere along the portal vein that you want. And as you start doing these exams and start looking at people's livers, you'll find that these structures are pretty easy to find. I feel like people have a lot of anxiety around, oh, am I going to find, like, am I going to confuse the portal with the hepatic, with the hepatic artery? But believe me, they're there and they're not that hard to find. If you're struggling with that subxiphoid view, it is often easier, I find, to move over to the patient's right. Are you saying it is okay to do this from both approaches? Because I do get that question often. I, I say it, it seems fine in, in the measurements I've done, but as someone who's yeah. done this, you think there's no difference? I would say in my anecdotal experience of, I don't know how many hundreds of these, the both, um, whether you're in the sub or the, the uh, lateral approach, you can get reliable data from both places. Because of bowel gas and positioning, I often find that the lateral approach is more reliable. So, I, especially in the emergency room, I think people are often sort of seduced by the desire to get everything from one view, where you could just go IBC, you know, and then rock the tail down and get your hepatic vessels. Um, but I think that sometimes it's it's worth it for the quality of the views to get IBC and then move. Um, but you know, you, your mileage may vary. Uh, one thing that I think is exciting about Vexus is that it's such a young technique uh, that hasn't been really rigorously studied is that like these are questions that we need to answer. Like it would be, you know, like at this point, I would say there's equipoise around, you know, which view is better and where we should put the Doppler gate. You know, the, these, uh, this technique is still sort of very broadly defined. And I think, you know, work to be done in the future is to refine the technique and expand upon it, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Is, is really all that matters that the pro marker goes like uh, cranial? I feel like as long as you are showing uh, that the flow is going towards the heart, uh, you know, as a whole, I guess, or away from the, away from down, away from the diaphragm, um, that's really all you, you need to get, right? Like you just couldn't, you don't want to do one where you have the pro marker down because your waveforms will all be flipped the opposite direction, but if your probe marker's up, like it shouldn't matter where you are along the costal margin, technically speaking, right? Exactly. Or theoretically speaking. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I think if you have that command of physiology to understand, you know, at the end of the day, it's not, what we're doing is not that complex. It's just looking at flow. It's just saying, right. where is the fluid going, uh, you know, at any given time. And once you sort of understand that, I think it really opens Doppler ultrasound as a really powerful tool for all of us. Um, you know, we don't need to be, um, and, and, the, and as you say, Jalen, those questions of like, oh, like where exactly does it go? And like, what exactly does this waveform mean? Like those nitty gritty distinctions become less important as you, uh, you know, as you sort of develop that understanding of, you know, that you can see hemodynamics in real time. Yeah. And it just becomes another tool like your stethoscope. Um, Perfect. but we digress. Um, I want to talk about grading the portal view. Uh, so now you've obtained your portal waveform, and what we care about for the portal waveform is basically the degree of bumpiness that we see. And so your portal waveform, remember the liver acts as this big resistor between the portal vein and the right side of the heart. And so you should see very little back and forth, very little pulsatility in that vessel. So in patients who are uh, not congested, 
we look at what's called their pulsatility index, which you can think of as the distance between the peak on your Doppler waveform and the valley on the Doppler waveform. And then you divide that by the, the total height of the peak, basically just a measure of bumpiness of the wave. And so in people who are not congested, your pulsatility index is low. So it's about 30%, like this person here. So it's even venous hum. Then you get to see people who are mildly abnormal. So this, swamp, this person is a little bit congested. And you basically develop sort of a continuous column of water or fluid that goes all the way from the portal vein through the liver to the right atrium. So every time the heart beats, pressure gets transduced back through the liver all the way to the portal vein where your probe sees it. And so blood is moving forward and back with every beat of the heart. And so mild abnormality is consistent with a pulsatility index of 30 to 49%. And so you can just see that there's more than a third of a difference between the peak and the valley in this waveforms. And then in your super congested patients, you get a pulsatility index of over 50%. So every time the heart beats, blood slows way down before it, speed, before it goes forward again. Again, uh, I want to emphasize the ECG lead here, locating us in the cardiac cycle, because this is another one where if patients are breathing, that change in intrathoracic pressure can change your waveforms. And so sometimes you'll see pulsatility in your portal waveform that it corresponds to the respiratory cycle and not the cardiac cycle. And if they're breathing fast, it can be a little bit confusing. You know, uh, you're never going to be breathing as fast as your heart rate is going, uh, but it can be a little confusing when you're first looking at it, and so it's nice to have that ECG to sort of orient you to time. The next view is the renal view. Many people find this one the most difficult, uh, and I tend to agree. So you basically, you just are gonna slide that probe down the patient's flank until you get this nice longitudinal view of the kidney. And something I wanna emphasize here is that the renal view can be challenging because unlike the other views where you're looking at a single vessel, in the renal view, you're actually looking for the sum of a bunch of the, the sum of the flow of a bunch of microvessels. And so what we'll often do is put the probe basically out here in the middle. You want to avoid being right in the middle, the hilum of the kidney. You want to avoid being way out in the cortex. Maybe kind of here, right in the middle, where you're getting the a lot of the arcuate vessels. What a lot of people will do here is they will use color Doppler to isolate their vessels of interest. So they'll just move that color Doppler box over the kidney here. They'll pause and say, okay, where do I have micro vessels that are kind of out in the middle here around the calyces? And then they'll find their target and then they'll use Doppler to target you know, that little vessel. And they will generate a waveform that looks like this. So as I said, here you'll notice that there are, that there's waveforms on either side uh, of the line. So the, classically speaking, all of the waveforms on top of the line are, that's arterial blood flow, because in the kidney you're catching both our arteries, you know, small arteries and small veins as they run con, um, in opposition to each other. And so on top you see arteries and you can see that nice arterial waveform, right? Uh, you'll notice that every ECG QRS is immediately followed by a bump on the top half uh, of the Doppler waveform. What we are interested in, because we're, we're venologists today, we're interested in the bottom part of that waveform. We're looking at the venous side of the circulation. And so while you can see that there are some bumps that are right beneath that arterial waveform, that's probably just artifact. You're catching some arteries that are going the other way. But what we care about is the space in diastole, the space between arterial peaks. And in a normal, uncongested patient, that should be pretty flat. You, you are not going to see bumps. You're not going to see big downward uh, diversions between arterial beats. That suggests that the venous portion of the kidneys are uncongested, that blood is just flowing through. So to summarize this, right, and this is obviously the renal view is like what triggers most people when you talk <laughs> about this for, for many, many reasons. To, to kind of make it easier, right, you're just getting everything. Right. You're kind of you're not at the exterior cortex. You're getting venous, you're getting arterial. And then you're just looking at what's flowing away from your Doppler gate. Is that correct? Exactly. And then, you know, it's great if you have the EKG, um, but you're kind of inferring based on the top of um, I'm drawing on my screen, but <laughs> uh, the forward, the upward deflections shouldn't have a ton of downward deflections associated with it, or you can look at the diastolic phase during your EKG, right? Exactly. And so one, it, like 
like a more of a shotgun measurement than I think most people think of this as. So, yes, uh, I think that's a good way to. It's a good characterization. Also, a shotgun measurement in the sense that it is often hard to get the like a really good view. This is a, a this is probably the hardest view in which to get a high quality image. Um, one of the metrics for a high quality image for this view is that you have well formed arterial peaks on the top side. And so, because sometimes you'll get it and it'll just be a bar, you know, and it'll just be schmutz. Uh, and you want to find a view where you have really nicely defined arterial peaks that tells you, oh, okay, I'm here, I'm over that, you know, one of those vessel pairs, so I can trust the data that I'm getting. I see a high quality arterial waveform. Now I know that I have, you know, I probably have a good venous waveform at the same time. And in order to get that view, sometimes you have to hunt and peck a little bit. So this is, you know, some, you know, this is a, a view where more often than not, it'll take you a couple tries to say, okay, I think this is a good spot. Oh, not a good quality waveform picture. I got to move my Doppler gate two centimeters to the right. We'll try again until you get a good looking view. So that's the normal uncongested renal view. Then we see patients who are what we call mildly abnormal, slightly congested. You'll see that you have that same arterial waveform on top. So you're still, you know, you're in a good spot. But if you look at the bottom of the Doppler waveform, you'll see that you basically have two downward deviations between each of your arterial beats. So these can be seen usually in diastole, and you're just seeing basically the, ref the, the same idea, that whole column of fluid that runs all the way from the right side of the heart all the way down through your renal vasculature. You're seeing a systolic and diastolic waveform reflected through the kidneys. And hey, could you show us those on this? Yeah, of course. And so what I'm talking about, they're a little difficult to appreciate. They can kind of slur together if your gain is not quite right. But you'll see, so here's your arterial waveform uh, up top that comes right after your QRS. I think I'm in the diastolic phase, you'll see these two bumps. So you'll see between here, it's really nicely demonstrated. So arterial beat followed by two downward deflections. I've, I've actually heard it described as like roller skates, which yeah, that's actually beautiful. like I, I love. Yeah, an, an ankle with roller skates. Yeah. And then as you get more congested, you start to see you know, what almost looks like that same sort of sinusoidal pattern that we see elsewhere, where you just see one big downward slur between your arterial beats. So you'll see arterial beat, downward slur, arterial beat, downward slur. And all, you, and all throughout diastole, you just have sort of like one big uh, downward turn. And so that is your severely abnormal, highly congested uh, renal phase. Okay, so those are the waveforms, uh, and it's a lot of information all at once. So I just want to quickly review kind of what this looks like. So if you start at the top left, we're going to talk about the hepatic waveforms first. And so if you start on the left, you can see that we have the hepatic mild waveform uh, is going to be you would normally see an ECG tracing down here, but you would see your S wave, which is gonna be larger in magnitude than your D wave. And then you see that repeated. As folks get more congested, then that relationship changes. So you still have that S wave that comes first, but you'll notice now that S wave is either the same magnitude or less than your D wave. So that you can have a, what's called a D greater than S sign, which is consistent with moderate congestion. And then finally, when you're severely congested, you get this, what looks like a sort of a sinusoidal shape, um, which is basically what happens when the S wave is now retrograde. So now you have a backwards S wave uh, that's going with the wrong direction. And the only time that blood is flowing forward is during diastole. And so you get that kind of up and down pattern. Then we go and look at the portal vein. And remember that in a normal portal vein, you that liver acts as a resistor between your portal vein and your heart. And so you should see just a flat venous hum on your Doppler, just like that. Then as folks get a little bit more congested, you start to see a little bit more bumpiness. So our pulsatility index, um, or just the distance between the peak and the trough on your, uh, on your waveform of uh, between 30 and 50%. And then in severe cases, as you can see here, uh, the bumps get really tall and the pulsatility index is 50% or greater. And finally, the most difficult view both to obtain and to interpret probably is the renal view. So when we are totally uncongested, you have this nice flat waveform on the bottom and you can see these arterial spikes, which correspond with, uh, with systole. 
Uh, and then as folks get a little bit more congested, you see the, the roller skate sign uh, or the, the two negative deflections below the line here. And then finally, once again, when people are, are super congested, you just see one big down slur during diastole. So again, it kind of takes on that sinusoidal shape. Brilliant. This was a, a great start, a great intro to this. Um, what I want to do is kind of break this up into two sections. Um, it was a lot of data, right? And it's a lot of data that we sometimes need some time to think about. We will do part two where we talk about the clinical application of this in the next episode. So stand by for that. Matt and August, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me and with everybody watching. Absolutely. Real pleasure. It was so good. I learned so much and I'm so thankful that Dr. Longino and Dr. Racinti were able to come on the podcast and talk to me and teach me and hopefully all of you about how to do VEXs, clinical applications and future pathways. Make sure to check out the five-minute Sono video on Vexus that is available and check out the Ultrasound Leadership Academy for a longitudinal, intensive, on-demand and online ultrasound fellowship. Check out soundandsurf.com and courses.coreultrasound.com. Hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.